clear the middle. Okay, then it is this person on my computer. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're going to play this one more time. Thank you for joining us um, online, at least. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sorry that we had such uh, technical difficulties that delayed the start of this talk uh, quite a bit. And sorry to everyone whose computer I now broke. <laughs> Ghost in the Machine is really the spiritual and intellectual successor. Uh, and I realize that I'm coming across really quiet, so you might need to adjust the microphone. 
go again, just a bit. All right, let's see. I think we can go up just a little bit more. All right, am I coming through any clearer? Any more clear? Any more clear? I think that's the best we're gonna get. Um, yeah, again, we've just been having technical issues setting up day. Anyhow, goes to the machines, the intellectual successor to my previous couple of Mesa talks. And so I'll be uh, revisiting those in brief before continuing on into new territory. Ghost in the Machine is my way of uh, communicating the concept of applying cognitive archaeology uh, to the methods of virtual heritage management. And that's a lot of jargon, so it's worthwhile to start just by defining these terms. First off, cognitive archaeology is a set of archaeological theories that inform practice and research design with a focus on the human experience, the human mind, the use of signs and symbols, and the ideas that those signs and symbols communicate up into the broader picture of ideologies such as religion and politics, and how these things feed into that. So cognitive archaeology is really an archaeology of the mind. And it begins with that study of how signs and symbols, symbols are a type of sign, come to acquire meaning. This is a field study that goes outside archaeology, outside of anthropology, and is broadly known as semiotics. Semiotics is some really dense stuff, uh, so that's really beyond the scope of this talk. But it can be summarized as the study of how, uh, how signs and symbols come to acquire meaning. The metaphor that I like to use when communicating this is that if we were to dive in and, and try to ask the question right off the bat, well, what does that symbol mean? We might be trying to look at something that is inside a box. So imagine, imagine someone you live with, your partner, your roommate, just ordered a box from eBay or Amazon, it's delivered at the doorstep, and you can't open the box, right? You're curious what's in there. So what can you do without opening someone else's name? Well, there's a lot that that box can tell you, right? If they ordered it from Amazon, it has an Amazon tape on it. And you can gain information from the sender address as well as uh, how it's addressed to them, the size and the shape of the box. You, you, can, you can pick it up and feel the relative density of it, and, and you, can, you can feel out, you can measure the dimensions of the box. You can take a look at what the box is made out of, right? So if if somebody ordered, say, car parts that are dense and heavy, it's going to have to be in something more reinforced, right? Like a wooden box rather than a cardboard box. And so, if we apply this metaphor to signs, to symbols, if we're looking at that symbol and we can't yet get at what, you know, what that meaning was, it might not have just been one meaning after all, um, but we can look at how it comes to acquire meaning and communicate meaning. So we're looking at the box at, with the symbol being whatever that thing inside the box is. And that's really the focus of what I'll be getting at in, in the next couple of slides. Uh, we'll, we'll be coming back to this. And then, of course, uh, we, get, we garner more information about signs and symbols and how they communicate meaning by the context in which we find them. So let's start off by taking the example of the petroglyph up here, which those of you watching, well, well, yeah, um, you can see on the slide, yeah, it's on the, the right hand side. This is actually a pictograph, I misspoke. So, Let's apply that metaphor to this pictograph. We're not really sure what it is yet, not at first, but we can look at how the sign is constructed. So we can see that um, this is not necessarily a single 
conventionalized design that's repeated again and again. This is more comprised of geometric elements, but they seem to be coming together into some sort of particular intentional form. All right? Another thing that we can do is we can examine it on the materials level, on the chemical level. Um, here we have a false color retouch, uh, this uh, emphasizing the, the red of the pictograph, even though it's sorting some of the, the colors of the, the rock substrate around it. But that tells us something about what it's made out of. We could do x-ray fluorescence on those pigments and examine the chemical composition, both of the pigment itself, likely a mineral pigment, and of the binding agent that adheres it onto the rock, whether that's an organic binder or otherwise. These things tell us something about the ideas that the person making this pictograph was trying to communicate and the way that they find meaning in the world. After all, the, the pigment that they choose might have particular significance and even the source. So if we were to look at pottery here in the southwest, the designs on, painted on the pottery are made with specific paint formulas that don't take, they go beyond the express chemical recipe and also are uh, diagnostic of where the pigments came from. So in other words, if there's a particular mineral that is important to making this particular color, not any outcrop on the surface of this mineral will do. Often what we find in the Southwest is that people will make pilgrimages to ancestral landscape, ancestral places, or otherwise religiously significant places to get the pigment and then bring it back and mix it in with the recipe for the paint. And, and there are chemical traces of where that came from. Ochre from one spot might have a slightly different chemical signature from ochre from another spot. Lead. Uh, lead is used in paints and pottery in the Southwest, and that uh, is actually one of the easier elements to trace to particular sources. And, and so we can tell that people are not going to every lead source, they are going to particular ones and returning to them over time. And so, again, if, if we're using that metaphor of a box, we're seeing the journey that the box has gone on, right? So we can see that there when people are going to source their pigments from a particular location, when they're making a pictograph out of pigments from a particular source, they are saying something about the connection between this image, where this image is found, and where the source materials used to make the paint would be found. And so, this isn't just a pursuit in uh, symbology. This is uh, cognitive archaeology does allow for this uh, scientific quantitative approach to understanding how things come to communicate meaning. And ultimately, folks in the past weren't necessarily using X-ray fluorescence or mass spectrometry to determine the uh, the sources of their pigments. And so we also have to understand that uh, what we can sense, what, what we can sense visually, tactically, audibly, is important to understanding how that comes to communicate. We're going two computers at once, I'll confuse myself. So anyway, anyone who's familiar with my prior work, uh, no doubt knows that I work in Virtualization. Uh, bump that down just slightly. I think I might have been clipping there. So I like to work in virtualization. And that is bringing archaeological data into the virtual space, into the digital space. And there's a lot of ways to go about doing this. This is something that has built up over decades with the um, first computer analysis of rock art being done by Leroy Garol back in the 1960s. Uh, obviously, we're working with more sophisticated and most likely less expensive equipment. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this is 
one of the, uh, the methodologies that really excites me and that I like to apply to the field. You can see on the slide that uh, the setups can be actually fairly small and lightweight, as indicated by there's three devices on this one tiny tripod. Um, and for both of you in the room, that, yeah, that's the same tripod. So uh, these devices can be uh, very small, very lightweight. We can uh, do some very expedient archaeology. Um, and then we can also do something more involved that creates a more immersive experience, especially in post-processing. This also gives us new ways of representing the archaeological evidence and of preserving the context, especially the spatial contexts, uh, of particular archaeological sites in ways that we didn't necessarily have access to before. And so with that, I can start to recap my previous case of talks and how they articulate with today's topic. Beginning with conserving sonic heritage, uh, my argument was that archaeological landscapes uh, include the soundscape around them and that proper conservation involves conserving that landscape. One example would be uh, of building dunes, as you see in the example in the slide behind me or next to me online. This is a set of booming dunes in the Mojave Desert of California. And booming dunes have been known for centuries. Marco Polo wrote about them. And uh, while they're found throughout the world, there is a disproportionate number of uh, booming dunes in the American West, particularly, but not exclusively, in the Great Basin and Mojave Desert. The closest ones to us, uh, I believe, would be uh, Great Sand Dunes in Colorado. So. Um, actually not terribly far away from here. Like I said at the end of the first slide, is that we have to understand these things in the terms uh, of how people would have used their own senses to engage with them. And so a prime example of how people used their senses to engage with booming dunes also comes from the Mojave Desert at another location that's known as Big Doom. Big Doom uh, was the site of seasonal, um, seasonal dances uh, attended by the Pahrump Valley Paiute and the Timbisha Shoshone. So this site where Big Doom is found is uh, an important cultural site even if there is actually very little archaeological evidence of the things that would go on there. Big Doom is a booming doom, and that is a part of the reason why it was used in these ceremonies. But before I get ahead of myself, if we do look at the archaeology, we can find first that there are blue pigments to be found in the immediate vicinity around Big Doom. We know from the ethnographic record that, as well as the distribution of trails and um, impasses that would have likely been used as trails, um, we know that it was connected with a seasonal realm for the nomadic and semi-nomadic inhabitants of the area that uh, connected directly with petroglyph sites uh, in that vicinity as well. At some of those petroglyph sites, we find pictographs made with a blue pig. Thus, again, if we're to take that metaphor of the box, we have just we have just inferred some property of the thing inside the box based on the outside, right? Like from the outside, without having that, that cultural understanding, we still know that there is some sort of connection between these rock art sites and Big Doom. Um, and so it's like playing a game of 20 questions, only you're probably asking much more than 20 questions, but it's very much like that, of um, diving into a uh, sort of deductive, inductive reasoning process that allows you to say progressively more profound things about human experience and the human mind. So if we're to return to Big Dune, and now we're to include some of that that cultural background, we'll understand that the Paiute in the area 
conceptualized the dune as a participant in these dances. After all, the dances involve song, and the dune itself makes sound. So the dune would be based on how people interacted with it with their senses, by all seeming had agency, it had animacy, it had an ability of its own to act, in particular to produce sound. So when we when we look at some of the archaeological sites that are connected to it, we can refer back to that significance that we understand. I keep reaching the wrong one. So the case of Big Doom is an example of Anecdotal evidence. Anecdotal evidence is one of three main approaches to archaeoacoustics that I outlined, with experimental and computational being the other approaches. Now, in the quantitative approaches, experimental and computational, there are a few standards, but the ISO standard for acoustical engineering is starting to take prominence. While other studies focus mostly on the anecdotal evidence, still, and so that would be a perfect example of gleaning useful information for a cognitive archaeology approach to the study of places such as Beidoun and the landscapes connected to it. If we take the example of the flute players at Mesa Prieta, uh, something that, in fact, there's more than one flute player in this, even though I've got the, got the emphasized version, but the clearer version, there's actually a flute player directly in back of this panel. And, uh, well, yeah, I think, can you see the mouse? Yeah, you can see the mouse even. So there is another flute player right back there. Okay, it's like having a, like having a laser pointer almost. So if we're to take an anecdotal approach, uh, we would understand that places where we find a lot of flute players, or we, we find even just some flute players, that flute players are meaningful. And, and we can see some of the contexts in which they, they appear in compositions, such as this in here, this clear composition. And we can see that it's arranged in a sort of procession. We can also note that the mouths of the forward-facing figures and of the two figures with bows facing to the side are all open. In other words, they're singing. So we're seeing this association between flute players and other musical iconography. If we were to take an experimental approach, we might go out there and make some sort of sound, uh, whether that's the sound of a flute or whether that's a test signal from acoustical engineering, to sort of understand the reverberation of that space. If we were to take a computational approach, we might look at the spatial distribution of the panels that have been recorded in that area. How do they, uh, how do they relate to the slope, the terrain, uh, how close steep walls are to each other. Uh, we could even try to model propagation of sound in this space. In the example of the ocarina, again, this is something we could take an anecdotal approach to, in that if we're starting to find ocarinas, we can already start to make inferences about about their use, but we could also take an experimental approach, trying to play a reproduction or even the original instrument to get an understanding of the sound that they produce, or we could take a predictive approach, simply measuring the dimensions of the chambers within it and then inferring the tones that might produce. And so that segues into last year's talk, which was sensory archaeology in which I argued that archaeology straddles both the sciences and the humanities. After all, we can do the uh, humanistic approach uh, of using anecdotal evidence to try to tie the archaeological record to directly to meaningful human experience, but we can also take the rigorous scientific epistemology, if you will, and apply it in a way that we can, um, we can test things, get quantitative results, and then try to relate that back. So again, we're, we're constantly straddling sin and the humanities and kind of feeding the information from one back into the other, rationalizing why we're doing quantitative studies, 
with the humanistic background, with the ethnographic record, and also describing the more humanistic story through the lens of numbers that we can reproduce. And it's funny that Kelly Hayes Gilpin, in a publication just last year, mentioned that she was warned in the 1990s that uh, archaeology and humanities should never interdigitate, um, which uh, clearly she laughed at then, laughs at now, um, because uh, Professor Hayes Gilpin, like myself, uh, of course, straddles this world of both STEM and the humanities. And that's what we're really doing with uh, both archaeoacoustics, the study of sound in archaeology, as well as the study of other senses, such as of color. And so, to flash back to the Purokdali Paiute, they're, uh, we're all familiar with color directionality. Here in the southwest, among the Pueblos, colors are associated with cardinal directions, as well as the directions of up and down. Um, but in the Great Basin, in the Mojave Desert, the color directionality is associated with a multi-tiered cosmos. And this is common among uh, U.S. Tekken speakers. After all, the Hopi concept of the, uh, the topology of the world, if you will, is also a five-tiered world. So to the residents of the Mojave and parts of the Great Basin, we have this five-tiered world that's sometimes called the Charleston topology. Uh, after all, it was used to describe Mount Charleston and is probably derived from that, which is a mountain between Pahrump, Nevada and Las Vegas, Nevada. It should be no surprise that if we're to start at the lowest level and, and go up, that the lowest level will be the underworld and will be associated with the color black with darkness. Valley floors are associated with red, and that's because the neighbors of the Pahrump Paiute, uh, participants in the same world, uh, participants in some of the, the same ceremonies, such as those at Big Dune, would be the Timbisha Shoshone of Death Valley. Timbisha, from their word Tumpisa, which means place of the red stone, or red pigment stone. So valley floors are exemplified by Death Valley, the lowest place in the continental United States. So the lowest levels of the surface world are associated with Right, so you see that association in here. Then the foothills associated with blue and green because you start to move into the uh, sagebrush and then up into pinyon juniper forest. So the world does take on that color. And then getting above the tree line, you start to get a lot of outcrops of yellow stones like quartzite. And so again, we see this, this color tier concept of the cosmos exemplified by uh, significant places within the landscape uh, to, uh, to the indigenous inhabitants. And finally, at the peaks, snow, clouds, associated with the color white and, and thus white with the heavens. We can also glean color from things that don't necessarily have color. Here, a black and white photo, but this, this is true for petroglyphs as well. Even in this black and white photo, we've got here, we have this cleft, this dark, dark black cleft that's kind of shaped like a serpent, and that forms the mouth of a larger reptile head. In fact, the inhabitants around this area, and I don't quote me on this, I believe it's the Chemohuevi, um, this is from a report by Mark Allen, uh, but the inhabitants of this area described this as a snake. Now, the snake is associated with the entrance to the underworld, so we have that color of black associated with the shape of the snake as a part of the broader head of the snake. And we see that, that black associated with the underworld. We'll come back to that in a moment, too. So, and this is one of those topics that gets people's eyes to roll. Uh, but we can, we can move now from, uh, from colors to how, um, how visual forms are acquired, but also this is a demonstration of 
using the senses to communicate. After all, this entire slide is just false color images. Uh, we've got a spectrogram of some, some acoustical data, so a visual representation of sound. And then we have a false color image using the plugin DStretch uh, that shows uh, some petroglyphs that were otherwise difficult to see. And this really helps uh, illustrate the process of meaning being made. Because, as, as I mentioned early on, when we are trying to get into the deeper meanings of science, the way we go about doing that is not going into the fine granular detail of how, what is the meaning of this sign. It is more, how does the sign acquire meaning, communicate meaning, and interact with other signs to communicate meaning. And we really have the interaction of multiple signs in this, in this box right here as well. This. And the visualization of sound is important too because this place has, uh, that's uh, shown here, has very strong reverb. In fact, it even has resonant tones, which is not always usual for a, a, a largely naturally shaped space. But uh, yeah, it's a really special petroglyph site. And so that also helps give us a glimpse into the process of meaning making. So, audience, I ask you to place yourself at this petroglyph site and imagine you're there as the petroglyph is being made. You'll hear the sound of the percussive tapping, uh, of, a, of a rhythmic tapping as a chisel stone, probably of quartz, is being driven into the limestone and marble substrate that forms the canyon walls, probably even at a rapid cadence. And it's reverberating, much in the way that this room reverberates, even though it's a smaller space. So uh, there are qualitative differences in how we perceive that. But I'm sure you're picking up some of that reverb on the stream. So imagine that's happening. Imagine that reverb. And now we'll focus on this big one sheep image. Again, in false color so that we can even see it at all because it's very faint. But that sheep image actually has seven lakes. And that's because it's crystallized in the process of becoming, in the process of emerging out of a much older petroglyph. There's a fully repatinated petroglyph right underneath it. That is what we would call an entopic image. That is an image arrived from experiences, the topic literally meaning behind the eye, but it can mean within the nervous system. And in this case, it's probably derived from what we call phosphate, which can be flashes from geometric patterns that we subjectively experience uh, under any number of circumstances. And what we tend to do with those images, because we are prone to try to make meaning out of a uh, a chaotic uh, world is that we'll try to find something that it reminds us of. And the, the most culturally significant symbols to us from our own cultural backgrounds are the ones that we're going to turn to the most frequently. In this case, the big horn sheep was an important religious symbol to the Nomic peoples, to the Shoshone Empire of the area. And so, when the artist is engaged in a, uh, in a religious experience, in a probably deeply meditative and reflective experience, one of the first things that's going to come up, one of the first ways in which that more abstract form is going to take on a more meaningful form, is likely going to be in the form of a big horn sheep. And so we see the reuse of that earlier petroglyph in making the big horse sheep. But like I said, it's crystallized in the process of becoming. The sheep is emerging out of the entire image, but hasn't fully subsumed it. And so we have the seven legs, and we see that, that the horns extend beyond the horns. Likewise, there's a concept called vowels or rhythmic sound horns. 
We find these in certain Zong traditions, uh, including among nomad peoples, uh, but certainly not exclusive to them. Vocables are closely related to the concept of glossolalia. And glossolalia, uh, which is really just making, uh, making vocalizations without them necessarily having words to correspond with, is a part of the creative process. One of the potential uses for petroglyph sites like the one shown here would be the acquisition of song to remember the old songs. So some of the images may be visual cues like mnemonics to prompt the words of the song. But also a part of that is a creative process of the turning of these, I mean, of turning these sounds into words. And we also have that in many of the songs, say, of the round dance tradition, in which there are what we call rhythmic song words, some of which are really just used for their rhythmic qualities, but others are used, oh, others are reflective of normal speech words with some modification on the end to meet the rhythm of the song, to be playful with that cadence. Right. And so a person in this space is going to be hearing this cadence. They're going to hear certain tempos amplified because of the reverb delay, because of the particular reverb qualities. But they're also going to hear certain tones. And that's what I have highlighted in this spectrum ring. So to read this visual visualization of archaeological data, of experimental acoustical data, Time is the horizontal axis, and then there's two channels of frequency, and each one of those two channels, frequency increases vertically on a logarithmic scale, so five powers ten. And what I've highlighted in the sort of blue boxes are areas where the are, are frequency bands where the sound is more intense. These are the resonant tones of that space where we have that seven-legged sheet. These are tones that you're going to hear again and again, no matter what sound you're making in there, whatever component of that sound, if it has any component of any of these resonant bands, that will be emphasized in the echoes beyond all the other tones. And so just spending time in this space, you will start to get a sense of certain tones. And so if someone's in there to acquire a song, that song is likely to include these tones. And that's also the case for where we find the Patrick panel in the back here. I've used a different color combination, uh, which is more of a uh, violet on black with the with the green highlights, but it, this is the same concept. You, you would read this graph the same as the last one. And then we see the petroglyph panel on the left of that, uh, that corresponds with where we hear this. So again, we have strong resonant bands. So a person in this space making any noise at all is going to hear tones in these bands more pronounced than in, in any other band. That's because it's in a semi-enclosed space and because of the shape and size of that space. This space is interesting because if you look closely at that petroglyph panel, you'll notice more intoctive forms, more complex abstract geometric forms, some of which have been combined to create more iconic or figurative forms, that is, things that look like things that we recognize, such as the case, and it's difficult to see projecting, there is a patterned body anthropomorph right here, missing a head, because its head is crossed by a chain of diamonds. And it has particular, particularly elaborate headwear, it has an elaborate body. But if we have the cultural context behind this, we can understand that the diamond chain is a conventionalized depiction of Togoa or Togoav, a rattlesnake, which, as I mentioned, Snakes form, uh, snakes are associated with the entrance to the underworld, and this is a, cr 
cross-cultural phenomenon that spans from the Great Basin all the way down to the Yucatan and Guatemala, um, covering and covering the space in between Central Mexico, Northwest Mexico, and of course here in the Southwest, we have an association of snakes and reptiles with the underworld and the entrance to it. Here we see a low, dark overhang just below the panel, like an entrance to the underworld. And it's also important to emphasize that when someone is perceiving the echoes in any of these spaces, that echoes, like reflections in a mirror, seem to be projected behind the surface. When you look at yourself in the mirror, you don't see yourself projected on the surface of the mirror. You see yourself the same distance behind the mirror that you are from. Same is true for echoes. And so when you're getting particular sounds, particular tones coming from the sound reflections, they will seem to come from beyond the surface of the rock. Moreover, the resonant tones in the space include infrasound, or sound below hearing level. There is a resonant tone at about 10 hertz. 10 hertz is very important because one, in auditory processing, that creates a lot of confusion around the direction that sound is coming from, but it also has emotional effects. And that's because it, it plays around with some of the fundamental waves that are used for parts of your brain to communicate with other parts of your brain, such as the alpha wave. The alpha wave is a 10 hertz wave of brain activity that, among other things, runs the visual cortex. So a person in this space experiencing the flashes of that quartz stone, because quartz flashes, it quartz traps energy in its crystal lattice, and when subjected to mechanical pressure, will flash every time that rock, that chisel stone gets tapped, that piece of quartz is flashing. And they're getting sensory stimulation that is causing their auditory processing to sync up with the same waveform that their visual processing is running on. And this is how a person can come to experience entoptic images, phosphates, geometric patterns across their vision, to which that they will then come to assign meaning. And this long explanation is all within the realm of cognitive archaeology. Now, we can't always take you to the Petroglyph site. Ones like the examples provided are, of course, culturally sensitive. If you can imagine a, a, a place that you interact with has the physical properties that confer the experience of not being alone, of being accompanied by, by spiritual beings from the other world, possibly even deities, then of course it's not right to bring everyone there. But we can bring the archaeological site to you. And that is where virtualization comes in. Of course, Earlier I mentioned the merits of using virtual heritage management to conserve the context of archaeological sites in, in a uh, resolution of spatial detail that we can't do by other processes, but it can also help bring you there and create another testbed for experimental approaches to archaeology. So what you see here is a landscape next to a petrical site in the Mojave Desert. There are several that are <laughs> included in this talk. And the, uh, the sort of bluish rectangles are positions where I had my camera as I walked around and through the site, taking photographs used to build the 3D model that you'll see in this that we have a problem. <laughs> This, this.
this talk is going to end very quickly. We'll be right back. Should have fixed it. Yeah. We're apparently having some lag in the stream, and so I apologize for that. Uh, this video is not playing as smoothly on the stream as I would like. It always glitches when you when you do the video. There we go. Imagine the person in the petroglyph site making the petroglyphs engage that haptic feedback, the vibrations of their body as they are striking stone on stone on stone. We can simulate some facsimile to that using the sorts of controllers that one might use for virtual reality. All while pr preserving these crucial uh, spatial relationships. Here's another example. And so we can see how we can have a space that we can both look around in. We can look about ourselves and, and see the petroglyphs and see the context in which they're situated. But we can combine this with that 3D structure as well, as I will demonstrate here in a moment. Again, we can combine this with the 3D structure and really experience this in a way that is progressively more comparable to, uh, to an on-site experience. Now, this video does have some artifacts in it, some weird things floating in the air, and that's simply because that this model needs to be cleaned up. 
There was a process to making these things, and this was done fairly expediently as a demonstration of how we can combine, say, a spherical image and the petroglyphs. We can also take sound in full 360 and associate the direction of sound in oh, from either a projection onto that sphere with the direction of a petroglyph panel, or we can also take it from the, uh, the origin point of the microphone, the origin point of the observer, and project it out, as I will demonstrate in simply one more step from here. Um, you're also seeing a screenshot of my screen rather than smoothly rendered because for some reason there was a glitch on the software that was not rendering the arrows when uh, this was made into an animation. And so then you just get this nice little um, sort of blend effect into, uh, I guess I just kind of skipped right into it there. Huh? But you can see the arrows from the observer's point pointing in the direction of the petroglyph panels from which sound reflections were arriving. So we can, we can get the direction of a sound reflection and the delay and associate it with a particular petroglyph panel. This is important when trying to place someone in the space because if we were trying to reproduce the, uh, uh, the, the sensory effect of a sound seeming to originate from behind a particular petroglyph panel or a particular archaeological feature, then we need to be able to actually place it in space, in, in, in the virtual space as well. Thankfully, with the equipment set up that you, that you saw at the very start of this presentation, that is entirely possible. So we can also integrate other methods in virtualization, such as, are you kidding me? All right. <laughs> As uh, there's not much to do, um, but uh, it, I had a, uh, a virtual planetarium on here, and why it will not display is baffling me. But you can see very dimly the constellation Orion. And that's what I was trying to illustrate here, is that using a virtual planetarium that runs on your cell phone, you can explore the night sky and connect the stars and connect the stars with any sort of star lore, if you will, with any astronomical tradition, uh, and, and so that's what this demonstration is. The stars of the constellation Orion line up with the big horn sheep down here in the corner. And so you've even got, there's Beetlejuice, there's a brick dot where Beetlejuice is. Rigel, 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 Zayef, Zayef, you've got what we know as the dagger of Orion, lines up with the upturned tail of this sleeping sheep, and the three stars of the belt line up with the upturned tail and hind legs of this sheep. In fact, in the oral traditions for the Timbisha, Shemokwevi, and even Mojave, who belong to a different eth ethno-linguistic group, um, the constellation Orion is described as the big horn sheep in the sky in Timbisha, Wasipi. And so we're able to connect the petroglyphs with these, uh, using virtualization, using virtual reality methods, we're able to make connections between oral traditions, the petroglyphs, and in this case, astronomical observation. This is also backed up by the Milky Way, which crosses, in the animation, it crosses through the frame. And we also have the Milky Way appearing as linear bands that go right by, there's, there's right there, right by the base of the panel, right where you would expect it to be, terminating in this row of florets, which would be a culturally appropriate metaphor for the Milky Way. And at the 
this one doesn't work, I swear. So, assuming that the sound works, which is a huge assumption, what you're about to hear and experience is a short virtual tour of that space with the leading sheep, accompanied by a uh, musical composition that I made using just the resonant tones in that space. No promises on this working, since uh, we seem to be having some further technical difficulties. and it's not working. In an actual virtual reality experience, you would be hearing the sound that goes along with that space, too. In that instance, it's uh, an artistic composition, but it could also be simply the, the, the reports from the, the pecking sound with the added reverberation uh, characteristics that that space has, the intensity, the delay, the, the decay curve that it takes. This is, uh, these are all things that could be engineered in to help give a better sense of a mercy person in that space. And the reason why we would do that is because, especially for petroglyph sites, many of these places are assumed to be religiously significant places. Some of the psychological effects of sound and visual stimuli could result in that the subjective experience of something that could be considered a spiritual experience. Like I was describing earlier that the combination of acoustic effects at a particular rock art site and the, uh, and the visual stimulus could um, could lead someone to actually seeing and hearing things and perceiving themselves to not be alone in this space. It actually works, and we can use virtual reality to test the characteristics of sight and what happens when we tweak those. What happens when we add in the haptic vibration or take it out? What happens when we, when we change the reverberation parameters or remove them entirely? Does it still have the same effect? Or are those characteristics of place crucial to having that subjective spiritual effect that we can actually quantify both in subject recording as well as in actual measurements of brain activity um, and in measuring uh, known properties or properties known to be associated with those? So. VR becomes then a test bed for an archaeology of the mind, and a very powerful one at that. And so I wanted to close on the example of the dunes because that dune is a very powerful place. Like I said, there are blue pavements. Well, at one of the examples that I showed you, and forgive me for skipping over this, It's subtle, it's hard to see, it's virtually impossible to see here without a false color image, but that blue pigment occurs at this petroglyph site, which is a good distance away, many, 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 many miles, but still known to be on the same seasonal circuit. So if we were to understand that blue pigment as being significant because it's associated with a dune that makes noise, that makes sound, and when we find it at this place, it should be no surprise that the characteristics of this location include significant
significant sound qualities. And that's actually what we measure here. Like that's what is visualized in this, uh, in, in this visualization of the acoustical data is that, that, that acoustical property that we also see referenced culturally by the application of blue pigments, by, by having that blue pictograph on this composition. Again, it's very faint. In fact, we see all the significant colors, right? We have, we have the black underneath, we have red and yellow mineral stains streaking down. We have the white that's created by pecking through the patina on the surface of the uh, of marble. And uh, then, of course, we have the blue, the application of that blue. Um, and this tying together of the perceived agency of a place through its ability to make unexpected sounds both at this location and at Big Two. And so we can actually say these, we can say some very profound things about that without ever having actually opened that box and, and, and talking to the person who made the, the pictograph, who made the petroglyphs, and asking them, if we can't ask them directly, what were you trying to communicate here? We've actually been able to make a lot of firm differences. And these are, of course, only possible by applying indigenous knowledge as well. And, and so with the sun setting on the dune, that's where I really want to leave it is the power of virtualization. I apologize for the constant glitches, uh, both in getting this going. Uh, we got going pretty late. And uh, also the, the unforeseen glitches during the presentation. Uh, again, these didn't happen in rehearsal earlier. And uh, for those of you who watched my chat with the archaeologist stream, that was uh, actually a fairly common thing to happen, is that we would have some kind of technical glitch that didn't happen in rehearsal. So uh, thank you for sticking through this. I hope this was informative. I hope this was digestible. Uh, because I do tend to use a lot of jargon and I'm trying to make these concepts accessible. And I hope I got people excited about using virtual reality to understand and communicate archaeology. Do we have any questions at all? Yes, uh, we have two questions. One is, do you lecture on this topic often or professionally? Ooh, good question. Um, I've touched on a few of these things, um, uh, particularly the archaeoacoustics and some of the examples that were in this uh, presentation uh, during previous professional talks at conferences. Uh, those were much shorter talks. I only just briefly touched on them. Uh, but it is a direction that I would like to take my research, my professional research. Uh, I would like to take it further in this direction. Um, there were also examples that I haven't shared publicly before this. Um, and so that was one I wanted to make sure that a particular animation played because uh, you saw it for the first time here. Okay, and then um, Jane says, I think I missed something, and coupled with my lack of te technology knowledge, I'm not clear how the sounds from a site are determined. Ah, uh, well, uh, the sound is going to clip when I do this, but I can actually bring microphone up into the frame. This is a specialized microphone. It's called an ambisonic microphone. This is used for characterizing the direction of sound from the place that, uh, that it's, uh, from the point where it's placed. I also use a, a different microphone array with um, uh, fuller spectrum microphones, uh, also four channel. This is four channel. That one is also four channel, but that one I use uh, because you get a much better quality of sound, and um, and so then uh, using software called um, I mostly use a, an open source program called Audacity. Although there are many paid and free softwares that you can use to uh, break this the sound down into its spectra. Uh, mathematically, this would be called applying the Fourier transform, which is just taking a complex waveform and then uh, uh, representing that as a compilation of much simpler waveforms, just kind of 
superimposed over each other. And so that's how we get spectra, is um, we take the, the lowest tone, uh, that's what you call your fundamental, and then um, you have relative intensity of anything above the fundamental. So say your fundamental is, let's, let's just not even put this in numbers term. Say it's a low C. You know, if you play, if you play piano, guitar, um, your fundamental is a low C. So then maybe your chords are all in C major, so you've got G and E in there. Um, and so as you go up the scale, uh, it, it, you, each octave you're going to have your C's, your E's, your G's. Um, and, and that's what we're depicting with, uh, uh, with spectrograms. Uh, sometimes these are recorded just in tables with, with numerical values for the, uh, for the actual uh, frequency as reported in hertz, kilohertz. Um, but it's really the same concept of uh, you're showing the chords. Now, it's not always a nice clean major chord, especially in complex spaces like, uh, like petroglyph sites. Uh, you'll, get, you'll get chords that are uh, discordant, <laughs> uh, and, and it, it makes sorting through the data a little bit more complicated. But yeah, I mean, like we're using multi-channel microphones, just good quality microphones. Um, this specialized one is just for the direction. And then and we're taking each of those channels and trying to identify within that um, what, what are the chords. Uh, when characterizing reverb, uh, there's the, there's the um, low-tech way, which is if you have a nice clean sound, like a, like a, like a snap, or there's a uh, spring-loaded device sometimes called the Waller device uh, that can uh, be used to uh, reproduce uh, a, a percussive sound pretty, um, uh, uh, pretty insistently, um, or even uh, the gunshot is actually uh, acoustically very clean. It, 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 it's basically all tones above its fundamental, and so if, uh, if you see in the, in, in the spectra that anything is, is, that there's any spikes in the spectra, you know, it's a resonant tone for the spot that you're in. Uh, the point being is that if uh, if we're to take that and if we want to study reverb, then we look at we look at what that the waveform of that sound source of the, of the spring loaded device of the snapping fingers or whatever, uh, popping balloons. Some folks use popping balloons. Um, and uh, we look at that in a space without reverb, and then we compare that measurement, uh, we compare that sound file to one where you know, it's in a space that we're studying, and we see how much longer it takes for it to, to taper off. We can see actually the offset in the, in the, from the original sound, that, that, that delay, that offset for the first echoes to come back. But then there's more sophisticated ways of, of processing this that um, kind of give you the, the, the shape of the, if you imagine this in the form of intensity, right? Like more intense, less intense, and you have time, and you might get an echo that goes up, or, or a reverb characteristic that's like sharp up and then tapers down. You can have one that's delayed longer and then up and then tapers off quickly, or one that's longer up and then tapers off slowly. And how we would report this using numbers and metrics is there's a couple of points along that um, that are, are mathematically fine that we would use to like we measure what the you know, with the initial, that, that initial time from the sound being made to first echo coming back, and then that's where the reverb starts, that's the delay, and we've got reverb, and then, and then along that, that sort of reverb cone as it's tapering off, we've got a couple of set points that kind of help us infer the rest of the shape of that. That was long with the answer. And let's check uh, if we have any questions on the YouTube channel as well. Um, oh, this sounds great, so <laughs> thank you. Um, well, thank you folks for tuning in, and uh, I believe we just had a uh, cancellation slash postponement on next month's talk, so that 
Um, that's now come to be uh, to be determined. Uh, we'll get back to you on who's talking next month, but we are hoping to have a speaker on once again the last Wednesday of the month in August. Uh, until then, um, of course, be sure to follow Los Luceros uh, State Historic Site on social media. They are much more <laughs> active on social media than uh, the Petroglyph Project is. But do follow us on there too. Uh, you'll see new content, uh, especially on our YouTube channel, because in addition to this, I will be uploading some recent conference talks. Uh, so there'll be, some, uh, there'll be some more coming out. Uh, we're still working to deliver you content, even though the chat with the archaeologist is done. And uh, I believe Los Luceros is going to have some fall events, right? Fall Harvest, September 25th. Fall Harvest, September 25th. So mark that on your calendars, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in the next